after 10 o'clock. I presume everyone's got their coffee and um, we welcome all of you to the, the show this morning. Um, and it's appropriate that we're going to be talking about environmental matters. Um, welcome to our overseas people. We have a, a young lady all the way from Canada this morning and um, it's really good to see how, how far our footprint has extended. And I'm gonna ask Peter van Niekerk who knows Andrew well to please do the introduction and then we'll get on with the show. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, John. Uh, it'll be my pleasure. Uh, Andrew did his engineering degree in the United Kingdom, uh, University of Wales, and then he also did a master's in soil mechanics and foundation engineering at uh, Southampton University in 1971. Uh, in 1973, he joined Nanam Shand here in South Africa in Cape Town as a senior engineer, and he um, had moved up the ranks. In 1985, he was made a director, and he was a director in Nanam Shand, a well known water resource. He just just got muted by accident, sorry. I don't know where we stopped. Uh, Got as far as joining, it's moving up the ranks in Nenam Shand. Oh, good, good. So, okay, 85, he became a director in Nenam Shand and he was in that position until 2009 when he moved as in a position of specialist consultant, uh, water resources for Nenam Shand and that is, this later became Oricon and was uh, amalgamated with a number of other uh, firms uh, in South Africa as well as overseas. Uh, in, in his career, he made significant contributions in leading feasibility studies for major water resource projects. The most significant of these are the Lesotho Highlands Water Project the original studies for the first phase, and then later on again for the second phase. Our paths crossed quite a lot in, in, the, in the process. He worked in many parts of South Africa as well as uh, Lesotho and other SADC countries. He, uh, he, from 2012 to 2013, he was the lead technical advisor for an 18 month feasibility study for the long term solution for asset mine drainage on the Witwatersrand, Rand, which is the topic of today's discussion. In 2016, he retired, uh, but he was still active in scouting, a lifelong passion of his. And he, he, there, he also made his mark. He was chief commissioner for South Africa for two years. So uh, my pleasure to introduce Andrew to you. Right, if I unmute my microphone, I'll get started, then I'll share the screen. Thank you, Peter. From Peter's introduction, it's how you might think that I should know quite a bit about things. But in fact, I know a lot about a little, or a little about a lot. Perhaps a little about the lot is the most appropriate one. Let me just get this slide, share the right screen. Okay, um, one more move. All right, can everybody see that screen okay? And is it on full screen? Not yet. Okay. There's no screen sharing yet. There we go. There we go. All, all ready to go. Okay, and you're seeing the full screen, not with the, the, the full presentation full, view. Full screen. Right, let me see if I can get my other view back, perhaps I can't. Okay, see if that works. Okay, so acid mine drainage on the Witwatersrand, uh, past, present and future. Uh, and Peter's introduced me, so we needn't talk any more about that. 
Okay, so I mean, as, as Peter said, it's based on this feasibility study, um, which we did from December 2011 through to July 2013. And then there's some recent information I've got from Department of Water and Sanitation and TCTA, which we'll talk to at the end. Uh, so basically the structure, I'm going to talk a little about the past, the history, largely about the feasibility study um, for this long-term solution. Uh, then talk a little bit about the short-term intervention, which is operating and was designed in parallel. And then a little bit about the present, where we are, and some hopes for the future. Uh, and at each of those points, I can just pause and see if there are any questions. Uh, if anybody's got anything as we go along that's not clear, please shout. And if I'm talking too fast, and I've been told by one at one workshop, Andrew, you're talking too fast, you're using words we don't understand, and I don't know what you're talking about. So I said, okay, let me start again. Uh, mining in South Africa, we had the government, uh, which wasn't controlling very much. We had the mines that were doing rather well, and we had these poor screwed water receivers on the far end. Uh, not my slide, uh, uh, that won't acknowledge whose slide it was, but it wasn't me. Uh, we know that we had the the gold discovered in 86, 1886, lots of income, lots of jobs, and basically the reason for Johannesburg and all the development that we recognize as Joburg today. Um, and in the 20s, half the world's gold came from the Witwatersrand, and in the 80s, we were still the largest gold producer in the world. But around the 1990s, mining operations started decreasing, essentially ceased in 2010. And that's what really caused the problems. Uh, with Vodasron mines produced an enormous amount of gold, 15,600 tonnes. I also work on during this talk on the principle that you can read faster than I can talk, unless I really get going very fast. Um, so I won't read all the lines on the text. I'll summarise and pull out a few key points. So the result of this mining was a billion cubic metre void under the Vodasron. Uh, down there, you've got the war, war, water and air reacting, uh, sulfide-bearing minerals to get and um, forming AMD, which is known as acid rock drainage in other, most parts of the world. It was fine. Everything was okay while the mining was going on. They were pumping out the water. Um, they were neutralizing it when it was being pumped. As pumped out, it was acidic, but they, they neutralized it, but they didn't do anything about the salts. Um, but as the mine stopped, they stopped pumping. They didn't have any, any reason to keep pumping. There was no requirement for them to keep pumping. So they stopped and the void started steadily filling with water. On the West Rand, there was a mine that had been pumping at 10 megalitres a day uh, and mines around them just stopped and the inflow was too much and they just couldn't cope, although they tried. So just against a backdrop of some of the nice clean water that comes out of a mine, we have 86, the start of mining, um, and this void, the West Rand Mining Basin, we're talking about these three, West Rand Mining Basin, Central Rand Mining Basin, East Rand Mining Basin. East Rand is the biggest void under the ground, but the Central Rand Basin stretches for 55 kilometers and has got the biggest footprint. To put this 100 million in perspective, um, Blumhoff Dam is just over a million, a billion cubic meters. Um, and the VAR dam is two and a half times that. So it's a very significant hole we've got under the ground. Um, okay, so in, in September 20, uh, 1992, the West Rand Basin started decanting to the surface and there was a, quite a lot of hoo-ha about it, uh, quite a large volume of water. This is, was based on what we were expecting at the beginning of our study, so we thought the Central Rand Basin would reach its critical level uh, in June 2013, and the Eastern Basin in June 14. So there was quite a bit of pressure to get things done. Um, I'm not gonna go into the chemistry because one of the scary things about this, there's somebody out there listening to this that knows a lot more about everything that I'm gonna talk about. Um, and so if I get it wrong, sorry, this is what we thought we, we knew in the study. But that's just a nice picture of the delights of Joburg. Um, and you get the pyrites, oxygen and water mixing together, forming yellow boy, which is a crusty cake, the sulfates and the acid. 
So acid mine drainage in South Africa, it's not just on the Witwatersrand. Uh, out on the, the west, we've got the base metals all across the, whoops, sorry, base metals all across this area. Uh, the gold mining we're fairly familiar with and down in Mpumalanga, the platinum minerals in the minerals belt, east and west limbs over here, and then the coal mining out again in Mpumalanga and down into northern Natal. And all of these produce acid mine drainage, but of different varieties or different chemical compositions. Um, so if we just look now and zoom in a bit to Johannesburg, we've got the central basin just south of Joburg, and you'll probably many of you know where the outcrop is all along Main Reef Road and the basin extends south of that. On the east rand uh, around Benoni down to Niger down here and then on the west rand Clarksdorp. Uh, it's important just to have a look at these rivers. Um, on the west rand this is not, doesn't drain into the Vaal, it drains into the Blowbunks, Sprait, Crocodile and Hartebeersport Dam. Uh, the, the central basin drains into the Clip River and the western, eastern basin into the Blessbox Break, Sekabos Rund and the Nature Reserve and Vile Dam and Soweto, which is important. So why does it matter? Well, uh, on the West Rand, uh, Vince 18 shaft, this was decanting from the abandoned shaft since 2002. Uh, it caused lots of pollution in the in the west, down the uh, rivers, down to the crocodile, and it accumulates underground. And it comes not only from the mines, but also generation on the surface from slimes dams, uh, rock dams, and, and all the rest. But it's not that a big a volume. So acid mine drainage to Witwatersrand, and if I'm just talking acid mine drainage going forward, I'm just talking about the Witwatersrand. It's about 150 to 200 megalitres a day. Rand water supplies about 4,100. Ireland's phase one is 2,000. Phase two, phase one and two is about three, three and a half thousand. And the Vile integrated Vile system yield is 8,000. So it's, in water terms, volume, it's not big. And it's not really the volume that's an issue. It's the, the quality. So this is just some pictures of what happens. This is, this is yellow boy. This is one of the sprites. Uh, after it oxid all the oxidization from the acid, not a pretty sight. A uh, few more pictures. These are the hippos in the Krugersdorp game reserve who went bright red for a while. And you can see the, the color of the water, the blessed box break went red, lots of uh, environmental impacts there when, the, when they were still pumping, but then when the treatment failed. So there were lots of public perceptions and myths are, and going around. Um, if you remember this, all these photo, all these newspapers of November, end of 2010, beginning of 2011, there was no shortage of publications. There was no shortage of uh, scare stories, allocated money, warning of a crisis. Uh, that was warning of the crisis that we'll talk about a bit later in terms of volumes. Uh, Metro's heading for a water crisis, don't panic. <laughs> Manuel speaks out, don't know exactly what he said in there. Mail and Guardian, Mail and Guardian again, acid mine drainage. Water wheel talked about it, the time to act is now. More articles. So there was quite a bit of public pressure. Uh, some of it was fact, and some of it, which I originally called it myths, but these days we call it fake news. So acid mine drainage will run in the streets of Johannesburg and Soweto. That was one. Basements in Johannesburg, Standard Bank, ABSA will be flooded. Foundations will be corroded. Well, they're actually pretty much fake news, depending where you look in Soweto. But the, right on the southern edges of Soweto, uh, acid mine drainage could come out. And we'll talk about that. Uh, mine Museum on level five at Gulf Reef City could be flooded. That's a fact, it's happened. So that's that, that was predicted and was going to happen. <clears throat> so the problems, so, although in going through this, I've got it in the particular sequence for this talk, uh, wasn't always the way we understood things when we started. So some of the things that come near the beginning, we didn't know at the beginning, we only found out later. 
but it makes it easier to talk to if I put them in now. Um, okay, so we've got this rewatering, we've got flooding of the voids, we've got it decanting to the surface. So we've got these potential seismics uh, may contaminate some shallow groundwater depending how high it comes. And if you get close to the surface, you can get some geotechnical impact saturated soils. Certainly an impact on the ecology, the fitness for use of the receiving waters is a problem, and the Vaal water security in the Vaal, uh, water security in the Vaal River supply area to Hoteng. And really, this was the driving force for the study. Uh, the ecology was recognised as being important, but I think it was this that actually pushed the boat. So the Vaal River system is quite complicated, and I don't go into the water resources. Uh, too much, but the Vaal River is the primary source of water that ran water supplies to Johannesburg, Pretoria, and out to the east and to Sasso. Um, they can get water from the Vaal Barrage, and then the water goes from the Vaal Barrage down the Vaal, down to Blumhof Dam, which serves a lot of irrigation. And there's offtakes in various places, there's quite a lot of transfers here. Uh, but it's qu quite a complicated system. So the water from AMD, where does it go? Uh, we start in the, I usually try and start from west to east, uh, just to be consistent. But the Western Basin goes into the Blowbunk Sprate, down, joins the Crocodile and ends up in Hartebeersport Dam. And during this, and it's not, not to say that it wasn't looked at quite seriously, but during the study and during the talk anyway, um, I've got a little bit more focus on what happened about on the central basin and the eastern basin and the western basin was actually dealt with a little bit separately which we try and get to. So from the central basin um, it ends up in the Clip River and then um, Natal Sprate uh, on the boundary uh, and all this area drains down and ends up in the Vaal Barrage and the eastern basin um, comes down the Reet Sprate and others uh, desk box sprayed and ends up in the Vaal Barrage. So what's the problem? The groundwater gets its water from Vaal Dam, so we don't need to worry. Uh, but that's taking a little bit of a narrow view of life, and that's really not what we wanted to do, because then if you get the salinity coming into the Vaal Barrage, uh, it goes all the way down the middle Vaal, and there's offtakes and users on the middle Vaal. Blumhof Dam becomes very saline. Um, and there's users and irrigation schemes. So there's quite a bit of economic impact of the Middle Vale and Blumhof Dam. And then if you, yeah, so that's quite a serious uh, impact down there. Uh, you can just see that Peter mentioned Lesotho, the, the feeds from Lesotho into the Vale as well. So, I mean, the Vale River system is important. It supplies four provinces. Uh, uh, and there's a Vaal River strategy, which is updated every year uh, to continue to see how the Vaal River manager in the future predictions runs every, in May every year, uh, when the end of the hydrological year to look at the dam levels and predict what's going to happen in the future. Um, and because it's under stress that water affairs was trying to eradicate unlawful water use, there are water conservation demand management measures in place, although you might not recognising it. Uh, phase two of the Highlands projects being implemented now. And then addressing salinity was the fourth leg of the strategy. Um, this is one of the graphs from the Vaal River Systems Analysis. And just pause there, because one of the people that worked with water affairs, not for water affairs, but with water affairs, Peter Van Royen, who was instrumental for many years in working on system modeling and the Vaal River system. Uh, unfortunately, in his late fifties, passed away last, a week ago. Um, so he was really a, an icon in the water resource planning and a great resource manager, great water resource manager and a very good analytical mind. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a sad time. But one of the diagrams that we used quite often, this brown line is the yield of the Vaal River system, about 3,000 million cubic meters per annum. Um, the red line is a high water requirements. The blue line is if you manage to eradicate unlawful water use. And the green line, hopeful, is if you can do the water conservation and demand management as well. So, uh, sorry, let me go back one. 
seems like I'm not going to go back one. Okay. Um, okay, sorry. Okay, go back. And that we, way. We're picking up voices in the background. Is anybody there talking behind you? Uh, let me just shut the door. Sorry, it was coming from the other room, I think. Okay, so. Sorry. Okay, so th this is the diagram as we had it at the beginning of 2012-2011, um, showing that we were projecting deficits depending on which scenario you look at. We might have a surplus if we can do the water control measures, uh, but if we just carry on an increasing surplus. So there was a problem, not much, no spare water in the valve. And the salinity, water quality and salinity are particular a problem. So if you look at the VAL catchments, uh, there's a lot of 27% of the load comes from dispersed sources in the VAL dam catchment, uh, point and diffuse sources. So sewage works, agriculture, and all of that. In the VAL barrage catchment actually contributes 39%. And this is looking down as far as the barrage. Um, sewage return flows from in the VAL barrage, 21%. And acid mine drainage is only 13%. So these are the biggest contributions to the salinity, but this is the one that was decided to tackle. These ones are much harder to tackle. They're all dispersed. There's different organizations responsible for, for the pollution and dispersed sources are always much harder to tackle. So the, this one, the underground mine water, it's got by far the highest concentrations and it's only in the VAL cat context, only of up coming out or at, is it, can be controlled in just two places, one on the east and one in the central. So it was a fairly soft target in those terms. So because of all the publicity, there was an interministerial committee set up in 2010, a technical report in 2011, and then for March, Cabin instructed recommendations to be implemented urgently. And those recommendations were a short-term intervention to prevent the violation of the critical water control levels, stop the water rising, and see how to neutralize the AMD and get rid of the heavy metals. Uh, and then the second one was to initiate the feasibility study, which is really the focus of what I was involved with. Uh, what I'll come back to the short term a bit later. So uh, that's... That's essentially the history, and I don't know if there are any questions at that point before I move on to the study and what we actually did. So I'll carry on, but okay, shout could I ask a question, please? Sure. Um, when I was working on the West Rand um, on a gold mine, we found that because the recharge of water into the mine was comparatively fresh, it was a dolomite area, that you the, the water at the top of the at the top of the water table inside the mine became less and less saline because it's been recharged and the the uns, the less saline water is lighter than the more saline water. You have much the same effect on coral islands, for instance, where the you have freshwater wells, but below that is salt water. Um, has that impact, has that been considered or, or, or is, it, is it a real thing? Yeah, we believe it's a real thing. I'll talk a little bit about it uh, and also a little bit about the challenges in actually utilising the benefits that would come from that sort of nearer surface water, if you like. Um, so, yeah, if I don't if there's a bit more later when I get to the water quality, just, just have another shout, please. It's, it's a very, it was one of the factors that we talked about. Um, so in the past, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what was going on, the parallel initiatives, our feasibility study, water quantity and quality, uh, the three options that we looked at for AMD, the main option for the feasibility study, uh, the environment we were working in at the time, the study structure and approach and some study conclusions, or not the technical conclusions, but the conclusions that I've put at the end of the study. And then right towards the end, I'll talk about the short-term intervention. 
Um, but I think I'm going to have to cut through some of it because otherwise we might be here all morning. Uh, so the short term intervention in 2011 was covering the three basins and AECOM and Golda were doing it and they were, that was running in parallel with our long term solution. So we looked at Okay, and they had to pump, look at pumping out the water to maintain the, the level agreed levels and neutralize and aerate uh, discharge to rivers and dispose of the high density sludge. They had a high density sludge process and high density sludge is a bit of a difficult animal to deal with. Uh, we had the feasibility study for the long term solution. Uh, was, we were originally targeting 15 months, but it was, during the study it was agreed 18 months, which was actually the original target time. So we had to, the questions, uh, when you start a feasibility study, you always need to make sure you've defined the question. Uh, otherwise you can end up only getting half the answer. So what's the feasible long-term solution and what's recommended? And we had all these different factors to take into account. In the end, in the end I think we produced 14 different reports and a summary report. So there was a lot going on uh, in 18 months and there was a technical team for each of these. So really the sort of key elements were communications and stakeholder participation, looking at and agreeing, getting agreed water control levels, whether the interministerial committee had developed some, seeing where the abstraction and location would be. And although TCTA in the short term had abstraction points, uh, Water Affairs said, please review those and see if we agree. Um, with those abstraction points. It would have been hell of a difficult to change, but uh, we did look at it and we're actually fairly happy, although there were some, some concerns about them which needed to be looked at. Application of the AMD, what do you do with the water afterwards? How you, can you treat it? What the heck do you do with the waste? Are there any opportunities for cost recovery from either the waste and who wants the water and where do they want it? And then the whole contractual implementation proposals. Uh, so we've got X, Y, and Z, the three normal dimensions, time, water quantity, and water quality, and we had to worry about them all. Um, Oricon, as Peter said, led the study. Uh, we had colleagues from, a lot of staff from Oricon, SRK, Stephen Robinson, Kirsten were involved, Chango Solutions, Spike McCarthy and colleagues, uh, Turner and Townsend did a lot of the financial modelling, and, and we had about 100 people working on the study at some stages. But it was a big team effort, and the team not only included the consulting team, but these got, uh, colleagues, Jurgo, Marius, Peter, Bashan and Jackie from DWA, Stuart to AECOM, Johan and Craig at TCTA, and everybody. During that whole study, I think everybody was working very well together because everybody appreciated the importance of it. And there was no time for rivalries. We just pulled together. If we had a problem, we discussed it came to a recommendation. So one of the things one always had to decide is what is the, how much water are we dealing with? And the best figures that could be de developed from TCTA, the IMC and so on, were the East uh, Western Basin, about half the Central Basin, and the Eastern Basin nearly twice as much. So that's 150 megalitres a day, and I've already spoken about uh, the comparison with Randwater and Lesotho. And in the central basin, the water was rising 120 millimetres a year. So it's quite significant, 14 millimetres an hour. So in a day, you could notice the difference and it wasn't going to stop. So there was quite a lot of pressure. Water quality was a big challenge. Um, there were lots of samples around. And this is a diagram. We've got an EC proxy for salinity on there and pH across this side. So these are a range of samples and I won't go into the details. Uh, this cluster were considered to be a pretty reliable grouping. Uh, um, and the trend, and I talked to our water quality guys, the guys looking at the mine water, and yes, the, through the dolomites and the water at the surface is different from the deep water. So we tried to look in each, to quite an analysis of the water quality samples, where did they come from, how had they been handled. Some samples we discard, results we discarded because they'd been brought to the surface, left in an oxygen rich atmosphere and, the, and they just oxidized. Um, so they were giving a very false picture. The water quality guy said the trend will be this way. 
And I said, okay, where will it end? And they said, no, the trend will be that way. Yes, but what were the answer? Where will we get to? No, the trend will be that way. I couldn't get beyond these trend lines. So we knew it was going to improve. Um, we didn't know how much, and we didn't know what the water quality was like in different parts of the basin. I know this is a hard one to see, so it's copied out of the report. Um, but just briefly, the TDS um, in the central basin was the 95th percentile was far, uh, 5,000 milligrams per litre, um, obviously lower at the other percentiles. Uh, mostly SO4, 3,000 parts per, uh, milligrams per litre there. And the Eastern Basin, around three and a half thousand at the 95th percentile and 2,200 SO4. Uh, one of the questions that water treatment guys ask is, sorry, what, what do I design my treatment plants on? And I said, well, we don't know what the water quality is, but use the 95th percentile of that table. And once we produced that table, we said, that is the water quality for this study. May not be true, it may not be the water quality, but that's what we're going to base the study on, and it's locked down. Uh, okay, so broadly, there were three alternatives to look at after the short-term inter intervention. Do nothing, dilute the, the, dilute the saline water, or reduce the salt load. So do nothing, um, you just do nothing. Uh, it's got a high environmental impact, a negative impact on the VAR barrage. And there's a, a target of 600 parts per million TDS in the barrage in the water quality management plan, and that would be exceeded. Uh, as I said, it goes down here, um, goes down here, and then Blumhoff is negatively impacted as well. So we could dilute it. We could release water from VAR Dam to dilute the AMD to acceptable standards. You'd need a lot of water, puts a stress on the water resources, and the VAR River system can't meet those water demands. We'd have very severe water restrictions on RAND water and other users and agriculture. So if we look at this, this is what would happen if this is what we thought the situation would be without any dilution. If you put in the dilution, you might need all this water. So everywhere goes into the red, even at the lowest demands. And Puddy Hardy Dam, first year 2026, when we were doing the study, we were told uh, 2020, but I uh, didn't believe that. So we always showed it as being 2025, which to my mind at that stage was more realistic. So this had real serious complications, not a happy situation. So, and we looked at what could, where could you get water from to delete, dilute, bring highlands forward faster, probably not possible to go to a water project earlier, or you can just change the targets. Say, so, well, it doesn't, 600 doesn't matter. Let's let it, let's see, just have higher salinities. And the modeling indicated it would increase to about a thousand parts per million. So then we looked at the economic, um, uh, sorry. Okay, so we could look at treating the acid mine drainage um, in the long-term solution, desalinate it to remove the salts, evaporate the brine, um, and then output water for the environment, potable or, industri potable or industrial water. We looked at the economic impacts of these things and doing nothing at different concentrations had a, about 9.5 billion negative impact Diluting with Highlands water and then bringing on Tagela early had these serious uh, economic impacts and reducing the salt load had an economic disbenefit of about the same as doing nothing at that concentrations. Um, there were some benefits in job creation and economic activity from that. But so that basically said, look, there's not a lot to choose on the economic grounds within the accuracy that we were actually working. Um, so it was agreed that because of the economics, the environment, and a number of other factors, short-term intervention would be the HDS process. And disposing of HDS sludge is quite difficult because it doesn't stand up on its own. It actually needs to be contained in some way. And the short-term intervention 
didn't include plans for that. So then the long-term solution, we had to desalinate it, evaporate the brine waste, and we got output of potable or industrial water. And we found it was quite hard to find anybody that would actually say they would take the water. Um, Rand Water actually didn't believe that they should have been doing the study anyway, not water affairs, not, not underwater affairs. So they really didn't want to talk to us and water affairs had to talk to them quite strongly to get them to give us any information. Um, and they weren't going to tell us whether they would take the water or not. So we also found that industrial grade water, uh, Sasso needs water, they actually desalinate the water they get from ran water so they even take out more of the salts because of their evaporative processes uh, and amd is not a big volume used by ran water so they weren't particularly concerned um, we thought it couldn't be operational till 2020 now since nothing has happened since we finished the study effectively and i'll talk about that uh, so it's now it realistically 2026 some dilution re releases were being made uh, certainly reduced to, to avoid spills from Bl Blumhoff. Uh, water quality is being monitored, and I'm not actually sure, and apologies, what the actual operating rules and regimes are at the moment. So having said the focus was down here, this was really what we had to focus on supplying. The fitness for use of the water resources and the security of the Vaal River system. So it was quite a large, we realized in doing some research, trying to get international experience, this was one of the largest volumes of AMD in the world. There's a lot of connectivity between the voids, but not between the basins. So West Rand is separate from the central basin and from the Eastern basin. It was quite hard to actually be sure what all the connectivities were, but water monitoring that had been going on indicated that the levels were consistent across the basins. Uh, one anomaly in the eastern basin um, so there was continuity but we didn't know what exactly how the connectivity was and although there were a number of different mines all with their own shafts they actually did put connectivity between the different mines for escape purposes and emergencies so although they didn't operate on the economics uh, across mine different mine operations. They did have emergency ways to get through, some of which had been closed off and some of which were open, but our mining experts believed that it was all connected. There's a lot of ingress into the voids um, from different sources. It's near the major urban centers and it threatens the water supply. So we had to keep the water down. I've talked about the short-term intervention uh, keeping below environmental critical levels. So they came from the interministerial committee and they were put together quite quickly and fairly conservatively. So we looked a bit more closely and we said, okay, and let's define an environmental critical level, which is where you won't or have minimal risk of contaminating the underground water. And we're not sure what the gradient is across the basin. So let's have an operational buffer. Let's have some freeboard. Water levels may vary, pumps may go down. So we had a target operating level for that ECL. And then there was quite a lot of pressure to protect Gold Reef City uh, and different mine shop, mine, the mine museum at level five. So we defined a socioeconomic critical, a socio, yeah, socioeconomic critical level, which wouldn't affect the environment, it was to protect environment, uh, ec economic assets and a target operating level for that. And there was also talk at the time that mines actually might want to operate in some in the central basin again, and they would have a uh, want to lower water level. So it was agreed that the pumping cost for the ECL and TOL up here was uh, a government national responsibility. But if anybody wanted to pump down to an economical, uh, socio-economic critical level, that would be for their account. And you know, the difference is about you know, two and a half million per annum energy saving by not pumping down to there in the, typically. So it wasn't insignificant. Um, if I just go back to this slide, one of the quest problems was, um, or one of the quest issues is if you want to operate to here uh, and you need, so you need the pumps in around here. And at the time you're installing the pumps, you might decide to have the option, you might want to be able to pump down here. 
So deciding what pumps to use and where to install them is one issue. Uh, and the better water, as we heard, is, is up here. So you not, can't necessarily put your pumps at the optimum level for water quality. Okay, this is where I get scared because it's geology and there's geologists around the table. Um, so the Western Basin, we had to look at the water control levels. It was originally proposed that it should be below these dolomites. We looked at it, um, sorry, below, down here, below this con possible connection across here. Um, we looked at it and decided it could probably be up here. And 18 Vins is the shaft uh, where the water is actually decanting. And we saw one of the pictures. Uh, where would it come out? It comes out to the west. This is the shaft. Uh, okay, that's where it was decanting. That's the shaft they're pumping from. Uh, and it comes all around out along here. But these decant levels don't really matter because the water is already coming out here, going down here uh, and in the Tuyalupi sprite and causing contamination. Uh, but these were the different levels we looked at. And the central basin, we looked at... Um, Okay, central Joburg's over here, and it's quite a bit higher than these areas, so it's really not going to be a problem. Um, we looked at the water levels. Um, decant level is 1620, and we decided, uh, agreed that 1520, 100 meters below the decant level, decant somewhere over here, uh, 100 meters below that should avoid surface water contamination. And these are the levels for the gold reef mine. Obviously, people are familiar with all the different the reef, reefs and so on going down here, um, with the Clip River coming down here. So the decant levels, if it was allowed to decant at 1620, <coughs> it would decant where the Clip River comes in. And this is southern parts of Soweto. So yes, there would be water in the southern parts of Soweto, um, not deep into Soweto, but in the Soweto. The CBD is up here. Uh, and those basements are about, the deepest basements are more than 100 metres above this decant level. So they're at about 1720. Uh, so there's no way the water could get up there because it's going to come out around here first uh, into the Natal Sprait. And this is a bit of the eastern basin and quite a lot of potential for decant around Nigel, the Nigel area into the Ellensburg, Ellsberg Sprait. Um, Okay, so yeah, so the decant would come in around Soweto, somewhere in, a, in this area, you could get decant coming out and around Nigel and around this part where the less box break comes through. There were suggestions that from some, uh, not doubters, but people putting the opposite view, that we should just let it rise to the decant level or perhaps to 1600, not 1620, put in a shaft and just pump it out from there. But we felt there were too many too many boreholes, too many unknown shafts, vent shafts, and so on, and the water might come out in various other places. We weren't quite didn't know where it would come out, so we were conservative. Um, in the eastern basin, we looked at it. Um, okay, the saturated dolomite here. There's a lot of surface water. The water table is at the surface. The original suggestion was to have a, quite a, a low. Uh, environmental critical level to protect below the dolomites. We felt that with the water, or our we, royal we, we felt with the water saturated, the flow down through the dolomites was always downwards and probably 100 meters down would be okay, but we recommended keeping the water down here uh, and then increasing it slowly and monitoring the boreholes that were being used for agriculture along here to see what was happening. Um, so this was a different view of it. Uh, so it was originally below the dolomite we recommended here, but with careful monitoring. Um, okay, so ingress was a critical part of it. Uh, we need to, yeah, need to decide whether you want to spend another, <laughs> at this stage, I could probably uh, go for about another 25 minutes, or I can skip through some of this a little bit quicker. I'll just deal with this and then see if we might skip some of the more detail on the feasibility. Uh, but the ingress comes from a whole lot of sources. And obviously, if you could stop the ingress coming in, some of it's from mine zone, disturbed zones coming, some from tailings dams, uh, some from open shafts and open pits. This is just one example of a shaft 
with a river running into it. So a fair degree of ingress coming in there. You can see other fault line or openings here. So the ingress, serious problem. So there was other studies and uh, Council for Geosciences did studies on the ingress. They were actually responsible for ingress control. So we looked, they looked and we, we analyzed with them the different sources of ingress and what was coming from where. So the five, that's 5%. Um, undisturbed geology is this part, which you can't do much about, but the red, the green, and maybe the blue, you could actually possibly control some of the ingress. Um, much more from tailings and slimes in the central area and surface mine workings, shafts and so on. And similarly in the Eastern Basin. So we estimated um, that we could probably save about five megalitres a day, and realistically cut off ingress of five, 10 and 21 megalitres a day in the basins and save about 36 million. So that uh, litres per day. So that would save about 160 million rand a year. And the cost of those control measures, we did some feasibility estimates is about 300 million rand in total. So a two year payback period. What's being done? Very little as far as I know. And we really struggled with Council for Geosciences who have a different budget line and they were struggling to get money to actually deal with this. And I don't know if it's changed now, but it was a very great frustration. So on our feasibility study, that's what I was going to be talking about, isn't it? But uh, talking about the feasibility study, we obviously look at a whole lot of different things to start with in a pre-feasibility stage, narrow it down, come up with a couple of options, analyze them on the financial, technical, environment, legal ideas. Um, so from this preliminary pre-feasibility solution, we come up with a more detailed option and end up with a concept design. We Treasury were quite heavily involved. There was a potentially public-private partnership exercise going on here. So their officials were involved um, in our financial modeling and so on, met their requirements and they require for a project of this size, these phases, and it's good practice. So it was what Water Affairs were doing anyway. One of the, sorry, this is on its side and I can't turn it around, technologically challenged, but this was just the flow of information all the different tasks, what information they needed, where did it come from? And this was based on our program, which was a detailed program. So these we were chasing, you need this information, we need it now. Okay, we're going to decide that is what the water quality is going to be. We're going to decide on what it is. So just brief, fairly briefly, our approach to the feasibility study, we looked at the ingress, we had the abstraction points, which we reviewed and with the TCA, TA ones, um, they were doing the neutralization that, um, and were, they were doing the neutralization. We needed the desalination. We looked at technologies and it was very interesting when we looked at these. Um, high density sludge, we looked at options for the neutralization um, and agreed with uh, CCTA, Gold or ACOM that that was the high density sludge was a really only preferred option. Other people have done things, but we were talking about 25 to 40 megalitres a day. And there were plants doing two or three megalitres a day. But when we talked to the technical people, they said, look, you don't want to scale up more than 10 times. So maybe if you've got two megalitres a day, you can get to 20 in a big plant. Um, lots of people gave us lots of, uh, we've had a request for information for people that had technologies. We looked at them and none of them were working at a scale of more than, I don't think any of them were at a megalitre a day, some were at a, uh, a cubic, uh, sorry, a few litres a day or a, a kilolitre a day. Um, the, some, you know, one, of, one of them had a trial plant, um, uh, or what were run a plant, trial plant for 10, 10 megalitres a day. They were producing a lot of hydrogen sulphide and they hadn't worked out what to do with it. They then got a water research commission project for three years. Um, they had a patent. At the end of the three years, they patented a totally revised process because it had changed so much when they actually did some more detailed research. So there's a lot of concerns around the treatment, the, the technologies, but we had to choose one that we thought would be safe. So we've got the untreated water, neutralized water, and desalinated water. What can we do with them? So we looked at all the options. 
uh, one of the things in a feasibility study, you have to look at the options. The residue projects, waste storage facilities, and HDS, we allowed for rock filled dams to pump the, uh, the HDS into it. There's quite a lot of gypsum comes, can come out of the process uh, in Vitbank. They're producing gypsum and they're doing reverse osmosis there and supplying the municipality. But there's actually not much market for gypsum. There's, well, there's quite a market, but there's an oversupply. So it wasn't going to be a high option. So we looked at all of these options and I'll just skip on. Um, so here we ended up with, we couldn't be sure if we could keep the, the salts out of the water. Yes, we could use it for agriculture, but there was a lot of research to be done and they had a two year project to do afterwards. Um, we couldn't keep it out of the environment. Uh, environment in its own right, there's no cost recovery, although it's a good cause. Uh, looked like you might be able to use it a metallurgical recovery of gold. I don't know anything about that, but wasn't proven. So we either had domestic mines or industry, and the solution we adopted for was to put in water storage. Um, I'll show the diagram just now, and just and then decide whether it was going to industry or uh, industry or potable water, or just to the environment afterwards. So we went through the whole lot. Um, we then did more detailed feasibilities on the preferred option that came out of this lot uh, and came up with the reference project. And the reference project had to use proven technologies, had to have a least associated risk, and we used it for all the financial modeling and budgeting and the designs. We did concept design, drawing, schedule of quantities, cost estimates, uh, financial modeling with various scenarios for income streams, um, and different funding models as well. So there's quite a lot of detail went into that side of it. What it actually then looked like, we decided we needed a balancing reservoirs, um, should have balancing reservoirs before we got to the HDS neutralization stage. Maybe iron exchange, uranium is a bit strange. Various results showed uranium in the Western Basin and some in the Eastern and other results showed very low levels from the same places. So we never quite understood how much uranium was an issue. Um, then the neutralization and a pump station, uh, reverse os sorry, desalination plant, uh, and then balancing reservoirs and a pump station to an industrial end user. We allowed up to there, and then we said, well, somebody can take it. And then these rock fill dams to store the sludge. And these were all done on plan with sites identified, locations drawn out, um, so on. So that reference project, I mean, that's what we think it would look like, but when it goes out to tender and you get uh, people bidding for it, it probably won't be exactly what's implemented, but we used it as a benchmark against which we could judge proposals. Um, so water control levels we've spoken about, abstraction, location, and methods we adopted for the, the sites that East, uh, TCTA or guys had done, what we could use it for, treatment technologies, waste management, cost recovery. And here we were talking really probably about a design, build, operate, and maintain contract. I think I've talked to that slightly. Communications and stakeholder participation was quite a big exercise. We obviously had management meetings with water affairs officials. We had technical working groups with Treasury, different depart different parts of Water Affairs, TCTA, uh, Council for Geosciences. We had workshop uh, meetings with them every two or three months for about 30 people. We had various interest group meetings and we had, I think it was, I don't know if it was two or three workshops with all the public interest groups together and they were quite interesting. Um, we reckoned the cost would be about 660 uh, billion Rand and it would cost nearly a billion Rand both solutions to operate. So the operating cost is a real key point number because this becomes wanes into insignificance because in seven years you've spent more than the capital cost. So if the capital infrastructure gets rewritten off over 10 years, it's not such a problem. Um, other announcements by 2016, they were talking about 9 billion. Um, and we needed to explore alternative technologies, uh, but there was nothing else proven at the moment. So what we recommended was 
for the pilot treatment plant, we actually recommended uh, as an alternative to a reference project in the Western Basin. I mean, this was done on the basis that we needed to go out to tender uh, within six months of us finishing the study. Um, but the Western Basin we recommended because it was not quite so critical, it was under control, um, that we that the neutralized water was supplied to anybody that wanted to put in a pilot scheme uh, to test alternative technologies. And the Water Research Commission got the mandate to operate that, and a number of pilot plants were installed and tested to see whether they could actually deal with real mine water from the Western Basin. Um, the overall implementation could either be could be water affairs, uh, in-house water affairs, or a public entity um, to contract with a service provider. We looked at that. We thought it'd probably be design, build, operate, and maintain. We recommended not more than 15 years, really, to allow for newer technologies to be considered. But anything less than 15 years probably wouldn't be attractive for a design, build, operate supplier because they needed enough time to recover their capital. We also thought about whether you should actually provide, pay for the capital costs, but their, their operating costs would come from revenue from water sales. Um, so the next steps for the EIA, would, for the, sorry, for the long-term solution, would have been to do a proper EIA, and halfway through it was agreed that the short-term intervention EIA would be put on hold, and it would be incorporated into the long-term solution. So it's never had an EIA. Land acquisition, um, most of the land we needed had already been acquired in the short-term solution. There may have been some extra sites. One need to sort out offtake agreements, cost recovery, the point the implementation. Our idea was that it um, could have been done by, uh, yeah, May 2016. Now that must, I can't think why that was that late. Sorry, because uh, we finished in 2013, and I think that would have been 2014. Sorry, I'm not sure about that. And procurement documents and the pilot plants. So, other steps ingress control. I hope something's happening on it. It's a real easy, soft option, uh, doesn't impact on anything else, and just reduces the whole problem. Uh, communication strategy is essential and we need there were some other ideas that came around which could have some merit maybe you could put a tunnel into the western basin down into the Tuilupi Strait we looked at it didn't look very attractive but it might have worked and increasing monitoring and evaluation there is never enough it's absolutely a critical feature so we said look this is a complex most complex in the world threatens the water supply uh, we did quite a detailed assessment of how to go about it, provide some opportunities for new technologies to come in through the pilot treatment plants, but we need ingress control, we need monitoring. So we could learn a whole lot from this study, um, and it adds to the wealth of knowledge which can be valuable for application anywhere else. But I don't know if it's been realized anywhere, not that I know of, but I haven't been following up anywhere else to, to know what, what we, whether the effort we put in, and it was 18 months of fairly intensive effort with 100 people. Um, so a penultimate conclusion from that study was there's more work to be done. So we looked at the Western, Central and Eastern Basin, but there's Evander, there's another mine voids here, there's out on the far Western Basin, there's Kosh, uh, and further out. So yeah, there's still work, more work to be done on acid mine drainage. Uh, and the ultimate conclusion is there's a whole lot more work to be done because there's all these other mines, and they're all creating acid mine drainage. Some may not have much impact, may not be much be of much water around, very dry areas, but one shouldn't just think that one solved the problem of acid mine drainage. We've looked at a little bit in there. Okay, um, John or Henny, I was going to show a little bit, perhaps five minutes about the 10, five minutes, seven minutes about the short term intervention. Do you want me to carry on? John? Yeah, yeah let's go ahead and finish it. Okay. Yeah. So we, we've spoken about the team being appointed. Uh, this was the decant in the 18 vent shaft in February 2010 uh, and didn't look very great in the Tuilupi Sprite. 
by 2012, they'd got it under control with some uh, some upgrading, some pumps, wasn't the final solution. Uh, and then the whole sprite looks a whole lot better in 2013. And it's more or less under control with a couple of caveats. Um, okay, so this is what the Western Basin looked like. We, we know about that. And this is 18 winds where it was decanting and running down the rivers. Um, it was stopped in 2012. They did have some problems during heavy rains and pump changes and so on. And in about, I think about two years ago, the whole substation and electrical infrastructure got stolen by the Zamazamas um, and the whole operation stopped. The treatment plant on the Western Basin was an upgrade, significant upgrade to what um, Rand Uranium, I think it was, had in place. So it wasn't a new plant, but it was substantial upgrades to what was all there, what was there. And it's never got very much below shaft collar level. Uh, these pumps, special, no, not, not just a, any off the shelf pump, they're operating in acidic conditions. They were imported, rights pumps, they're all stainless steel, lots of seals, and so on. If I recall, they installed, had one pump installed um, and a standby pump on the surface. They didn't have a standby pump installed. Um, quite a lot of that because the conditions down there are not something you want to leave a plant standing around in. So the whole, uh, it was obviously quite a celebration when the pump was installed. So this is the central basin uh, high density sludge setup. It's quite a big footprint, uh, normal sludge beds, uh, structures. And just another view. So it was quite a major infrastructure development project on the central basin. Um, and the central basin, the ECO, the critical environmental critical, critical level, their critical level that they've determined a 1467 was exceeded in 2013. Um, our ECL 1520 was exceeded in 2014. So it was a very close call. It wasn't exceeded by much, but that's 100 meters below decant. So it was less than 100 meters below the decant level when they started commissioning in April 2014. Uh, and if they hadn't got there, it would have, uh, within a, a year, it would have been decanting. Uh, it got to 1544, so 24 meters above where we were, uh, 102 meters below some surface points. Um, but in 26, they got down, to, sorry. Yeah. Okay, in, yeah, in 2016, they got it down to 1530, and it was dropping at about 20 millimeters a day. But in April 2020, this year, it was back up to 1539. So they've had some problems. And uh, the Eastern Basin, uh, they went past 12, 1280 in 2014, and got to 100 meters of the surface. Uh, and then it would have occurred, decant would have occurred in 2016, but they stabilized it around that level. So it wasn't much time to spare. Um, they started pumping in 2016, uh, various levels, and it was been dropping. Uh, and they reached a target operating level of 1450 in three months. But there's been a few problems. We actually recommended getting down to 1280 and monitoring. And I don't know if there's been monitoring of the borehole uh, abstractions for agricultural use. This is just the eastern plant in a more in a finished state, very similar to the central plant, except in capacity. Um, just just a little bit about what's happened. Uh, the pumping we estimated in our feasibility study that the western basin we would should pump twenty or sorry was the inflows twenty three megalitres a day was what was expected um, without any ingress control. The installed pump capacity was thirty five. And over the last four and a half years, they've been pumping above the 23. Um, look, just no, I don't, and they're not really gain winning. But one of the problems there is the sludge disposal, which is going into a pit, and that's the high density sludge is quite wet, and quite a lot of that leaks back down into the void. The central basin uh, 46 was what we were the target level. They installed much higher capacity pumps because they were some concerns uh, and revised estimates. And since then, they've been pumping above the 46 all the time, and it's still not going down that much. And the Eastern, they installed 110 and been pumping around about the 80 all the time, but not, not winning. 
very briefly uh, in this central basin. This is the water levels from 2012, October 2012, through to when they started commissioning in April 2014. Obviously, during commissioning, it was still rising. And this, since then, it's been bubbling up and down just around this level. Uh, not really getting down, not getting down to where you'd like to be. So again, quite a lot to learn from there. Um, the water level supply, this is, uh, I think that's, no, sorry, that, that's Renmind. That's Gold, that's Gold Reef City level five, where the museum was. Um, this is their other level. And this is where the theme park gets its water supply from. So not too much room to spare. This one is the, looking at the central basin and rainfall, I tried to look at this and the only conclusions that I could tentatively come to was this is the rainfall and maybe this rainfall is causing that increase in water level. Maybe that rainfall is not doing that one, and this rainfall maybe that and this rainfall that. So there's quite a lag of eight, nine months more after the rainfall before you get an increase in water levels. That's real thumbsuck conclusions. Just to look at this on the central basin, um, this is water level. These are different monitoring sites, uh, thanks to Water Affairs and De Milan uh, for this um, different sites. This is the pumping station site. This means there are, is uh, 19 meters above ECL. And interestingly, right across here, you get across to uh, CMR and it's nearly 50 meters above the environmental ECL. So these are, there's quite a variation from just a meter above, and I'm not sure why it's only a meter above at that point, to nearly 50 meters above. So the gradient, and it's not a uniform gradient across the basin, is something like 48 meters. So our, our buffer zone of perhaps 25 to 50 meters was a good thumb suck. Uh, and so if we didn't get, they didn't get this under control, we'd have had these decants. And on the Eastern Basin, again, this is when they started, uh, we went through that ECL, started, got up to this level, started pumping and treating, and the water level has just been bubbling along along here ever since. Um, so not really able to draw it down to give themselves any freeboard, uh, get down to target operating levels. Okay, this is just the water monitoring levels and the only ones to look at here, there's a couple, these are, uh, I'm trying to think where they, uh, grit flow is where they're abstracting from. So it's 76 meters above the ECO, but there's a couple here at 130 and 140, nearly 140 meters above. So something like a 40 meter difference here. And these uh, shafts, we were always a bit concerned and TCTA also, that those may not be very well connected to the main void or they may be lagging a long way behind. And that's again, where it would have decanted. Uh, the pumping is coming out from Groot Flay and these are some of the monitoring shafts. So uh, monitoring ongoing incoming water quality. I don't know quite how that's varying to answer the earlier question. We did expect that the water quality would vary as you pump um, and you've got fresher water coming in. It's not water that's been sitting down there for years. They need to increase the pumping. Uh, environmental monitoring needs to keep going and borehole water monitoring for contamination. The sludge disposal in the Western Basin is going into a pit. In the Central Basin, it's going to Ergo's tailings facility. In the Eastern Basin, the high-density sludge is being piped and put back down a borehole, back down the void. So a, a percentage of what they're pumping out, they're putting back down again. Uh, it's a borehole down in a deep part of it. So hopefully the it's not affecting the water quality, but it wasn't a recommended long-term solution. And they need to keep analyzing the data um, and maybe adjust the target operating levels to know how much the variability they're getting across the basins now. Nothing's happened on the long-term solution that I'm aware of since 2013. In fact, I'm sure it's not. Uh, Val River systems being updated uh, urgent all the time. Water quality modeling needs to be redone. Um, and dispersed sources of pollution. Be nice if some action was being taken on those because they're contributing a lot to the VAR of a system salinity. 
Um, the probable indications are that the salinity in the VAR barrage and Blumhoff are not as serious, or particularly the barrage, not as serious as was anticipated. So um, since it's now seven years since we did the study, it really needs a revamp and an update of the study before you actually go out to tender and invest a lot of money because there's a lot more information available than we we had and maybe based on what we did hopefully you know, can do a more updated study so if you want to get more information the reports most of the reports are actually on the website water affairs websites under projects and amd feasibility study long-term solution thank you questions huh Thanks, Andrew. Quite, quite a comprehensive presentation. I must appreciate it. Um, yeah. So people can unmute and um, switch on their videos so we can see everyone. What I've talked about is what I could remember from seven years ago. I don't know if I can answer the questions from, from that long ago. Okay, just starting with the very simple side of it, and you mentioned that, you know, keep it simple. So, so in terms of the, the ingress, what, what, what would that involve? Is that to basically stop um, rainfall and, and other overflow from storms and that running into the system? Yeah, look, I mean, what the, one of the obvious ones is to go to each of the shafts and make sure they're properly capped so that there's no... Yeah. Sorry, so the actual, where you saw that river flowing down, um, hang on, just let me just try and get to, uh, how do I get to a different view? No. Yeah, we want to... Let me see. You can stop sharing and just... Um... Share yeah. again. There yeah, we are. Mm. Now I can get to turn my video on. Can't do three things at once. Mm. Oh, it says I can't share my video because you've st you've stopped it. The no, host has I stopped. No, I didn't. No. Okay. Well, sorry. Maybe Maybe still muted. Okay, carry on. No, it says I can't start my video because the host has stopped it. So I'm not sure why. No, uh, I I don't take any responsibility for that. No, <laughs> st still can't do it. Anyway. Okay, yeah, so, and then there are various streams that go across, um, uh, uh, I mean, where the, where the reef, uh, the outcrop of the reef, all along Main Reef Road, sort of that area, all along there, there's, there's reef outcrops and to the south of that, and some of those are just open. So you, one could, no, not all of them, but you, they could be closed up. Some places there are rivers that run across outcrops, which in um, Emerentia, Emerentia and Florida areas, they've put in some canalization to carry the water across those. Um, so there's, there are a number of fairly easy physical interventions that you could do. Yeah, well, that, obviously that would be the, the keep it simple starting approach, and I thought that would be a priority. Um, no, it should be. Mm, yeah. And, and just before John Weaver's got his hand up, just an extension of that, I mean, the, the impact of the Zama's Zama's is that huge? I mean, you talk about damage to infrastructure, but I would imagine, you know, the activities down there are probably opening up channel ways and also causing a problem. I don't, think it's I don't think it's causing a problem in the void because the void is pretty interconnected. Um, okay. Obviously, the real risk is if they get to tackle any of the infrastructure that's been put in for the short-term intervention, such as substations and power lines, mm. uh, that would be a problem. But underground, I don't think that's really a problem. Okay. John Weaver, you had your hand up, or have your hand up. Yeah. Um, the acid drain is caused by uh, a dissolving of the oxidized pyrite. Now, I was wondering if any long-term modeling has been done to determine the half-life of uh, of this pyrite. In other words, uh, in the future, does, does will the uh, production of acid mine drainage slowly decrease? Uh, I don't know. I, let me just, like the politicians say, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked it, uh, but I can't <laughs> answer it. Sorry. Uh, and I believe, I mean, that, just a question, there are a number of initiatives that should be being investigated and with pumping and so on being monitored in different places in the 
uh, basins being could be monitored. I think there's a lot okay. of work could be done to understand the water quality better. Okay, because one of the important uh, corollaries of my question is, uh, will will this uh, intervention uh, costing, what, I can't remember the price, a few billion rand a year, continue for the next 100 years, 200 years, or only 20 years? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was not, the 2016 estimate was 900 billion and a, so eight, eight, 800 million operating costs. I mean, we were saying that we needed to run it, run what, what we had proposed for pro probably 15 years, but 10 would probably be give you a good idea. And by then new technologies might come on and one would have a better handle then of how the water quality was changing. I mean, I don't think you'll never stop all the ingress. So there'll always be ingress. So there'll always need be a need for pumping. Um, what quality of the water will be that you're pumping as it changes and the uh, salinity and, and acidity uh, as, it, you know, as the pH increases and the salinity decreases with time, which were the projections, uh, but I don't know where the end point is. Okay. Okay. Have, have, you, have, 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 you, got, have you got two screens there? You want to try sharing that, that screen again that you just now? Just one more try? Oh, you want to share the screen again? The one that you that you were trying to share. Just see if you can do it now. No. Okay, next question. Are we lost again? No, is there? Screen, screen should be there. You are, but it, it's your it's your last slide that you've got on there. Yes, what do you want to see? Sorry. No, you, you, you were trying to bring up another another slide just now for a question. And oh, I thought no, no, don't don't think so. <laughs> okay. Okay, no problem. Um, further to my earlier question, I, I understand what you're saying, and, and a in sort of possible answer to what John Weaver said, the the the, wa the water at, the, at depth should equilibrate chemically with the pyrite in the long term, but I I don't quite understand why stopping ingress is is a good thing because ultimately. Isn't the idea to eventually dilute um, the surface water as much as possible to get rid of the salinity? And, and, and maybe a further thought on that is, um, shouldn't, we, shouldn't the pumping be from deeper, from as deep as possible, rather than shallow? Because you're pumping the, the, more, the less polluted water out rather than the, um, the heavily polluted deeper waters. Are you suggesting that if we, uh, and I'm not sure what level they're pumping at, um, so I'm not, I assume they put the, installed the pumps to be below certainly the, the recommended target operating levels and possibly lower levels in the central basin. And I think there are facilities to, I know the pumps were also designed to be able to pump against a higher head um, than actually they might have been installed for. Um, but it's, it's really a question if you, do you pump out the, the worst water, which might be the deepest water, and hope that it it improves with time, or do you pump out the water that's perhaps the, the better water from as near the surface as possible, so that your treatment costs are lower? Um, stopping the ingress is just because then you've got a, you've got less water to pump. Um, it's all going to get. I mean, it's just you just don't want to keep on having to pump it all, and you need to put it through the treatment works because it won't. Be, uh, certainly need to neutralize it uh, until you get to a point, if you do, where the pH gets to a level where you could actually discharge it. And I'm not sure at this stage whether we know, and I say so I don't know what the monitoring results are from the short term intervention, whether actually that's a trend and how fast it's going. So I think the ideas are, are interesting, but uh, one would, there's a whole project to do on the results coming out of the short-term intervention and what the future could look like, which is why I say I actually need to update the whole study. Thanks. Okay. There's a question from Mushati Mulawi. There's a question from Mushati Mulawi that says, thank you for an excellent talk, Andrew. 
she wants to know how, what would your advice be to aspiring AMD consultants and how they can better conduct such studies? Is she in Canada at the moment? No, no, she's a local girl. Uh, otherwise, stay in Canada. Uh <laughs> <laughs> she's studying in the in the free state. Uh, okay. So, what would the so what would be the uh, advice uh, for somebody? How, how would they better better do these studies? Or these AMD studies. What you know? Which direction are you proposing for them to concentrate on? Look, I mean, okay. I think the. I mean, there's there's definite scope, and there are people doing research on the scope of different treatment technologies for dealing with, um, to some extent, the, the acidity. Um, but in the, this basin, HDS is working, and I'm not can't recall what other options were considered. Uh, but the, the salinity, the reverse osmosis, is an expensive exercise. Uh, it uses a lot of energy, um, but it does have the advantage that it doesn't really cost much more to reduce the output, the salinity or the salt, salt content of the deliver, water that's delivered down to an industrial standard. Um, so, but the other technologies look interesting. If one wants to get into understand more, I think the questions have been asked about the water quality in the void and seeing whether the monitoring that's being done at the moment and the short-term intervention and the shaft monitoring can actually give us any more useful information to actually refine what we know. Um, but the biggest, I mean, the, the pumping's fairly straightforward and perhaps don't know if there's much opportunity to see what byproducts one can get and if there's any beneficial outputs from that. Um, we could really only identify the water and the gypsum as potentially useful. Uh, with, the way we approached it was to say that any, anything that any, any technology can come up with that gives them some byproducts that they can use and sell is for their benefit. Um, so that was sort of an incentive to, for the op potential operators to be a bit creative. Okay. And maybe what we should do, Matlachi, is we'll put you in, in touch with Andrew and Andrew can pass on some of his advice and you know, yeah. do, do some mentoring. With, with pleasure. Yeah, I mean it's a big it's a big field. Yeah, <laughs> and as I say, I didn't, at the beginning I didn't know anything about acid mine drainage. Uh, I knew about feasibility studies, but I didn't know a lot about this. Uh, John okay. Weaver has another question for you. John, would you want to just unmute yourself? It's uh, not a question; it's a comment, uh, Andrew. You. Uh, you showed a slide with uh, rainfall versus rise in water levels. Uh, as a hydrogeologist, that slide makes a lot of sense to me. So uh, uh, you do always get a lag between rainfall and, and uh, water level rise. Uh, you might want to get some expert hydrogeologists to just have a closer look and give you a paragraph or a, set, a couple of pages on that on that slide. Uh, uh, was it <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, we knew there would be a lag. And I mean, I, I got this slide a couple of days ago. So I tried to look at it and decide what it was telling me, um, apart from the up, ups and downs in the water levels. And I couldn't quite make sense of the comments, some of them. Um, but yes, yeah, there was going to be a lag. I was just interested to see. Sometimes it's quite a, a marked spike and sometimes it's not so marked, but this one's a particularly noticeable one. But the rainfall, well, yeah, it was a bit heavier in that year. So, yeah, very. So that was quite interesting to me. I don't have any intentions of doing any more work on acid mine drainage or doing this talk again. So I'm not going to be writing the paragraphs. But if somebody else, <laughs> somebody else okay, wants well. to to look at it, and I and I, I don't actually know whether TCTA and Water Affairs are actually looking at these results. I mean, they're getting all the res monitoring results. And Nico de Melon doing a good job. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, and I hope they're actually looking at it. I did try and get hold of Mario Skiat to see if he could shed any light on some of these things, but he wasn't available. Okay, well, we've got John Weaver down for a talk. John, when are you available? Uh, sometime. How about that? <laughs> I'll, send you, I'll send you the slide. Sometime next year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, guys, I've got to run. So, uh, there was also guys, have fun.
Yeah. Are you? you will just look after the question. Any, any, there was a there was a question from Jean Milan, I think, just commenting or about or asking why didn't you just leave the water down in the Dolomites and let it, um, in a sense, neutralize itself? Uh, no, I mean the water's in the eastern basin. The water's just coming from the Dolomites down into the voids. Um, mm. So, and we we. we Wanted we you know the water we're happy to leave the water in the dolomites uh, it does neutralize itself and yeah and I'm sure the water that comes through the dolomites down into the void is much better than the stuff that's deeper down um, but one didn't want to it's not that the simple. basic concept was not to let the get stuck not let the the void water decant hmm. okay, okay so John John Weaver here answering that. Um, the, the the dolomite aquifer is the largest aquifer in South Africa, and you definitely don't want to pollute that. It's a major Absolutely. major water resource for South Africa, and you want to keep hands off that. You will have screams of horror from many many quarters if you if you if you if you try and pump that acid mine drainage into the dolomites to neutralize it. Mm. Thanks. Oh yeah, I don't think that would go down very well. Uh, mm. Okay, the seed is a question. Uh, utilization of natural processes such as wetlands. Uh, was this investigated from Jean and Anita Simonis? Um, yeah, look, I mean, part of the study with, when we were looking at uh, if we released the water to the environment and it didn't go to potable or industrial use, um, there was a catchment management strategy and uh, water quality requirements and flow requirements, uh, environmental management flows, and so on for the. The, the tributaries, although some of it wasn't, some of it was fairly uh, uh, preliminary studies. Um, uh, but the water quality or the environmentalists, uh, the water quality fringe part of the environmentalists didn't want uh, saline water, uh, much more saline than the potable water. But the, was it the option for looking at the, the reed beds? I mean, the Clip River um, has a tremendous amount of reed beds and wetlands in it and that definitely has quite an impact on the water quality that comes in from the top from Soweto and that ends up coming out at the bottom so yes it's certainly something that one should look at and see if one can if one didn't want to take the water for the industry um, or potable water and the return I mean the water going into the rivers is not very significant in terms of environmental flows um, but not to be discounted and the return, the income that you could get from industrial water was significant. And we got to discussions with Sasso. Um, they were actually prepared to build a pipeline from the east, eastern basin, potentially, and maybe linked to the central basin, take all the water to Secunda uh, if it was almost, almost distilled water um, to use in their Secunda plant uh, because they were needing additional water and at the moment they get their water from Rand Water via the local authority. And they were really seriously interested in buying the, the water, um, paying useful money for it. Okay. All right. I think that's been a, a, a good show and thanks everyone. Any, any last questions? Thanks again, Andrew. And thanks Peter for the introduction and um, thanks Hedy for running the show. Any final, final questions?